One thing to sin in secret, that's bad enough. But when you attempt to bring it out and sin in the open, flaunt it before the world, then may I say to you that you've gone to the bottom. That's the reason I believe that this book has a message for our nation or any nation. That's the important message that we'll hear from our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, today on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus. And while you find your seat and open your copy of God's Word to Hosea chapter 7, Greg and I have a quick update for you. Now, as you may know, this week the World Prayer Team is traveling on our knees through eastern Africa, and tomorrow we'll make a special stop in Uganda, where God is definitely working through His Word. So, Greg, why don't you give us a quick update and then tell people why they should sign up for the World Prayer Team. That's usually my job. (laughs) Yes, I know. uh, If you want to receive tomorrow's email. Yeah, Steve, the ministry in Uganda is just, it's just a, a, a wondrous thing to behold. It's its God having raised up some men. We met them through just providential circumstances. They have, they have loved the ministry through the Bible. They wanted to bring it to their people. They have owned it. It's a partnership. They are paying some of the bills for yeah. this and providing the staff. Yeah. And it's just a wonderful ministry. Yeah, Yeah. the other thing that I appreciate is they run that ministry in in Africa. Anybody that knows anything about Africa, time is kind of a relative thing in terms of start and stop. A different concept, yeah. This thing is like a Japanese train. (laughs) It runs on time every time. Once they started the broadcast, there were no repeats. They didn't fall down. They didn't have to restart. And, and, And we've got processes in place to prevent that from happening, but we haven't had to use any of them because they've been so committed yes. to getting the Word of God out to their people. So professional, such great stewards of the of the funds that we've uh, invested, and the fruit is just there. Now, you, you asked me to uh, kind of say to people, why should you sign up for World Prayer today? Sign up for the World Prayer team today, yeah. because tomorrow, if you sign up today, you will get a special email about our ministry in Uganda, and it's going to have have links to two video clips. Now, you and I just watched them together yeah. in the studio, and it would be kind of complicated for us to play it and for people yeah, to and hear the, it. And the language but, and all that. So we're kind of saying, just sign up for World Prayer today. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray. It takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Give us your email address. We will never send you anything except requests to pray. Yeah, and you will be blessed and encouraged seeing how the Holy Spirit is moving in so many different countries around the world, and you'll be able to pray not just globally for countries and for the whole word to the whole world, which is our byline, Yes, but you'll yes. be able to pray for specific people in specific, oftentimes very hard places, and people are literally taking their lives into their hands by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And don't you love it, Steve, when we hear from World Prayer Team members that say, I'm learning about geography, I'm loving praying for yeah. specific countries, and praying for brothers and sisters yeah. uh, who are suffering. I really love the virtual community that's developed yes, as a result yeah. of that. And I would ask you, if you're not already on the World Prayer Team, <laughs> what have you been doing recently? But besides <laughs> that, if you don't have anybody specifically praying for you in your life, you sign up for the World Prayer Team, and you will have other people yes. that you will not meet this side of glory that are praying for you on a regular basis. That's often a common theme that we get from people that write to us. We never anticipated that. They're praying for their other brothers and sisters that are on the World Prayer Team. It's true. It really is a wonderful, spiritual, virtual community. Now, just just a word about these videos. We have just a minute that we can explain. And this is one of the themes of what we're seeing in these responses. And if you sign up and get the videos tomorrow, you will see they talk about people coming from Muslim backgrounds coming to faith in Christ through the Luganda broadcast in Uganda. And so we just really really want to encourage you to see those videos and, and be encouraged at what God is doing. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, let me pray for us as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would continue to bless the ministry in Uganda as it's in Luganda now and going out into other languages. I pray for the producers there that you would keep them faithful and that you would continue to use them in a wonderful way in Uganda. Pray for our, our program today, Lord, that you would bless it as it goes out. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're still in this section where we find God dealing in a rather harsh way with the northern kingdom. 
And yet in a very tender way as he is attempting to call him back to himself before judgment comes. And here in the seventh chapter, Israel turns to Egypt and Assyria instead of turning to God. And Israel, as he will say here, Ephraim is like a silly dove. And he has a few other choice metaphors for them also. And we'll look at that as we get into this seventh chapter. Now, I want to read verse 1 of chapter 7. He says, When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered, and the wickedness of Samaria. For they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. Now, this has been the first mention of Samaria, I believe. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. At least Omri made it the capital, and then his son Ahab and Jezebel, they built a palace up there. And in our last tour, I insisted that that be put on the tour that the folk could go to that hill of Samaria and see the fulfillment of prophecy, the judgment of God upon what is probably one of the most beautiful spots in the world to have a palace or a home for that matter. It's on a hill that overlooks that entire area. You can see to the west, the Mediterranean, to the east, the Jordan Valley, to the south, the city of Jerusalem, to the north, Mount Hermon and Megiddo. What a choice spot, and there's nothing to obstruct the viewpoint in any direction. But today, it's a desolate waste. The judgment of God is indeed upon it. Now, what was happening in Israel was this, that the sin that had been covered is now being uncovered. That is, what they had been doing secretly, they're now doing it openly. That is, there's no shame or no conviction, no conscience relative to their sin. And it's as it were, the Lord would forgive their iniquity, but they persist in it and go farther in it. And this last step, I think, is probably the worst step of all. It's one thing to sin in secret. That's bad enough. But when you attempt to bring it out and sin in the open, flaunt it before the world, then may I say to you that you've gone to the bottom. That's the reason I believe that this book has a message for our nation or any nation. This nation happened to be God's chosen people. They sinned against him, and he sent them into captivity. Now, do you believe that any other nation could get by with the same type of sinning? And this certainly is characteristic of our nation before. Now, when I grew up, the few homosexuals in our city, for I lived in Nashville, Tennessee at that time, they were undercover. I tell you, they were operated rather secretly, and they didn't come out in the open. Now today, they're having parades, and it's being uncovered that are all across this nation today that there is not called girls, but called boys, homosexuals, and that it numbers in the hundreds of thousands. Now, today, even the courts have been lenient, and the lawmakers are making it easy for them. What was done in secret is now brought out in the open, and that's characteristic of other sins. Somebody said to me some time ago, they said, well, Dr. McGee, in our day, people sin just like they do today. I said, yes, they did. And I said, for I was saying, I said, I was with that crowd. I know. And this party says, well, what's the difference? Well, I said, I'll tell you, in my day, we kept it secret. It was kept undercover. But today, that thing is brought out in the open, and it's flaunted before the world, and it's called a new morality, and there is actually given to it sort of a halo. You are new and daring and courageous. And I heard that compliment given to a girl who admitted that she was living with a man she was not married to, had an illegitimate child. Well, may I say to you, perhaps I'm a square, but as somebody said in a letter the other day, the thing 
that we like is that you're square. It keeps you from going around in circles. Well, maybe that's it. But frankly, I must say that we're stepping downward as a nation. And this is not a mark of any advancement. It's a mark that we're losing what was called civilization, actually a Christian civilization, although I never believed it was that. Now, verse 2, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about there before my face. God says they are now doing all of this out in the open. I knew, he said, that they were sinners before, but they've taken a step farther away from me, and I'm tempted to call them back to me, and they continue on. In other words, they have reached now the lowest depths of immorality. Now, in verse 3, they make the king glad with their wickedness and the princess with their lies. And the king applauded all of this. And the princes, they applaud all of this sort of thing. And I think it's tragic today when the leadership of the nation in any field, whether it be education or science or politics or in the church, give themselves over to foul and blasphemous language, which they now are doing. That's something else that's out in the open today. Foul mouth, leadership today. And they applaud this sort of thing. That means you're a he-man. It also means you've got a very poor vocabulary, by the way, and not able to express yourself. Now, this is something here that is very applicable to this nation. And it's been applicable to the great nations of the past that have now passed off the stage of human events, and they today lie in rubble and ruin and covered with the dust of the ground. Now he continues on, verse 4. They are all adulterers like an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. Now, here you have something, and this is another figure of speech that I think is quite interesting, that the baker got his oven ready, but he held back the heat of it and didn't let it become hot enough to cook bread until he got the dough all kneaded and ready, and then he turned the heat up. And this is a tremendous metaphor that he's using here. He says that immorality, and he says here, they're all adulterers. And he's not talking here about spiritual adultery. He's talking about gross immorality. Now he said heretofore they've kept this undercover. But now, he says, they're like an open oven, heated, hot, you see, hot with passion. And today, why the thing that you get the impression of is that men are trying to prove that they are virile, and that women are trying to prove that they are sexually alert. And today, that seems to be the thing that's now out in the open, you see. And today, this obsession with sex is something that is tremendous indeed. And he goes on now to say in verse 5, In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with skins of wine. He stretcheth out his hand with scoffers. In other words, the king has become an alcoholic and he's making a fool of himself. And again, the thing that we've mentioned before here, what was it that brought down the northern kingdom? Well, it was idolatry. It was turning from the living God. And that always leads to gross immorality. And gross immorality, as we've indicated before, wine and women, the bottle and the brothel, Sauce and sex, that is the thing that occupied the attention of those people. Now, let me ask you a fair question. If you think that I'm a square being unfair today, or I'm a bigot or something like that, may I say to you, as you look about you today, what is the chief occupation of men and women in all walks of life? Isn't it an occupation with liquor and with sex today? Hasn't that become a very prominent thing in this civilization of ours? Now, the thing is, 
It's brought out in the open today. And when it was brought out in the open in Israel, God says, I'll have to move in and judge you now because I've been calling you back. You were sinners all the time, but you were covering it up. Now you brought it out in the open. Now I read verse 6. For they have made ready their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. Their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth like a flaming fire. In other words, everything is done to stir up the passions of men and women. And we hear this so-called sophisticated argument about pornography. Well, today we're adults and we ought to be able to choose what we want to see and what we want to hear. Well, I'm not able to choose what I want to see and what I want to hear on the radio and on the television today. And I can't walk down the street without I see things and I hear things. I don't choose that. It's more or less chosen for me. And I'm with the opinion that there are a great many people would like to see better things and hear better things than we are today. It's owing to whose liberty that you're talking about and whose freedom that you're speaking of. Now, he says, verse 7, they're all hot as an oven. And I think, oh, boy, is that a picture of our nation today. They're all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. Now, he begins to talk about their kings are fallen. Well, may I say to you, the northern kingdom never had a good king. If you were with us when we were back in the historical books, and in my notes, I list the kings of Israel and Judah. Now, Judah had a few good kings. In fact, five of them that led in revival. But the northern kingdom didn't have a good king in the lot. Every one of them was a king that was as wicked as he could be. And Ahab and Jezebel, I suppose, reached the bottom of the list, but there were some that would run him a very close second. You may be sure of that. Now, let's continue to move on down here. And by the way, I should add that many of their kings were slain in the northern kingdom. And they made about nine different changes of dynasty. In other words, it started off with Jeroboam, and you don't go very far from Jeroboam until somebody gets in and murders his line, and another line starts out, and it doesn't go very far, and then somebody else is murdered, and then you have some that only one reign. The son didn't even make it to the throne so that that was a judgment upon them. And the kings were kings that God did not choose, you see. It was the line of David, and that line should have been the line that God would bless, not this line in the north, and he certainly did not. Now, verse 8, he says, Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. God never goes in for mixture. Have you ever noticed that? And I don't care what it is you mix. He somehow or another has never approved of that. I know that certain mixtures in food are delicious, and I like to mix fruit juices. It makes, I think, a marvelous drink. They put together pineapple juice and papaya juice and all these others, and it makes a very delicious drink. But for some strange reason, God never went in for mixture. God has said that it's best that you and I stay on our own level, in our own crowd, actually. And you will find that has been true. And that's one reason God's people today, God's children, born-again believers, ought to begin to recognize that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And this question of race, our color, or of any kind of other thing that would divide us ought not to divide us if we're in Christ. And there is a real division if we're not in Christ. Now he says, Ephraim is a cake not turned. And here we go again with another good homely illustration. And Hosea has many of them. Ephraim is a cake not turned. What does he mean? Well, if you've ever cooked pancakes, you see in that day they cooked on top of the stove and they never had a oven as we have it today. It was a matter of 
cooking these cakes, and they still do that over in that land today. They're cooking on top of the stove. Well, it's like pancakes, and they can be burnt on one side, and on the other side, they can be raw, and that is what you have in this picture here. You have a picture of a nation hot on one side but burned, and on the other side, raw. What a picture it is of them. They're burned on one side, raw on the other. They blow hot and cold toward God. The story is told, it's a sort of a fairy story about a man wandering through the woods, and he came to the house of a very strange individual, and this man that came in was a very strange individual himself. And so the man that lived in the house said, are you hungry? Would you like to have a bowl of soup, porridge? And the man said, yes, he would. And as he came in, he blew on his hands, and he said, my, my hands are cold. And he blew on them. And they sat down to eat the soup, and the man blew on the soup. And the man that lived there said, what are you doing? He says, well, it's hot. I'm making it cool. And so this man that lived there jumped up and ran out of his own house. He said, I don't like anybody that can blow hot and cold. Well, my friend today, that's the way a great many people are doing as far as Christianity is concerned. With one crowd, they blow hot. With another crowd, they blow cold. On one day, they blow hot. On another day, they blow cold. Ephraim is a cake, a pancake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here, and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, and they go to Assyria. Now, if you've ever been dove hunting, you know that if a dove has a nest with either eggs or little ones in it, that if you go near, why, she will act as if she's got a broken wing and actually let you get very close to her. She's luring you away. Now, that actually is not smart because it tells two things. When you get that close, you know there's a nest nearby. That's number one. Number two is she endangers her life. Now, here was Ephraim. Ephraim now, not turning to God, ran first down to Egypt for help. And then she changed and went up to Assyria when Egypt wouldn't give the help it wanted. Back and forth like a silly dove. What a picture. In verse 12, when they shall go, I'll spread my net upon them. And when I was a boy, I remember we used to get a big box and prop it up and put corn under it. And we'd hide over in the barn and the doves would come and we'd have the corn outside and lead right under and when two or three doves got under that box, we pulled a string, and the box came down on them. Silly doves. That's what God says here. He says, I'll spread my net upon them. I'll bring them down like the fowls of the heavens. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they've transgressed against me, though I have redeemed them yet they have spoken lies against me. God had a redemption for them, and yet these people were turning from the living and true God. What a picture it is. And they have not cried unto me with their heart. When they wailed upon their beds, they assembled themselves for grain and wine, and they rebel against me. They didn't realize that the famine they were having was a judgment of God upon them, and they were crying about they had no food. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. That is, you put an arrow in it to shoot, and the thing breaks, string breaks. It's a deceitful bow. You can't depend on them. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. And actually, Egypt will begin to mock them and ridicule them for the way that they were acting in that day. May I say to you, this is a very severe section of the Word of God, but it ought to have a message for us today. Somehow or another, Hosea 
is not the most popular prophet. He wasn't in his day, and he won't be today. Now we're going to pick up right there next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Hosea's message probably wouldn't be very popular today, but his message certainly is for our time and for our nation. To find out more about this ministry and how you can partner with us in taking God's whole word to the whole world, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit us at ttb.org. Tomorrow, our study of Hosea continues, and I sure hope that you'll hop aboard the Bible bus as it passes through your town. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?